on the call. Uh, to, no, no surprise, it was of, of interest to, to folks. So really pleased to be able to, to share our insights and our experiences and to hear from you as well about your own insights and experiences as well. Before I get going too far, I also would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we're meeting today. Um, I'm joining you from Wurundjeri country, uh, the land of the, uh, of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are joining us in today's uh, webinar, indeed any of the, of the series that the AES run as well. We thought this is kind of a, a little bit in two parts uh, today uh, of, of, of what we'll talk about. And I'll do the, the front part and, and, and Nick will do the, the, the second part. Uh, and then, as I said, we'd love to hear your, your questions and your comments and your own experiences as well. But we thought we'd start with a, a bit of a review of all why collaborate in the first place. What are we actually talking about? What are some of the reasons that might drive us to, to collaborate and the reasons why others might drive uh, to, to collaborate as well? A little bit about well, what do we mean by collaboration? There are all of these words, and Stuart mentioned some of them, all of these words that we use to describe collaboration. Uh, it's different forms and functions and the different entities in which it takes. So a bit of a review of what do we mean by collaboration? What is it? Um, move on to well, why are we going to invest in learning and evaluation for collaborations? Uh, what are some of the, the reasons that, that we think that it's important to invest in, in effective learning and evaluation for collaborations? And what are some of the the benefits and the results that can come from that. A little bit about well, what can we go about evaluating when it comes to different collaborative initiatives? What are some of the, the different questions that we might ask of collaborations? Or what are some of the different methods and tools and approaches that are available to evaluators and those that are working in different collaborative structures to better understand the work that they're doing? And then a little bit about some of our sort of suggestions and recommendations for, for what those that are, are working collaborations can do to, to better undertake their evaluative work, but perhaps also what we as evaluators can do uh, to find different ways into collaborations to help bring them to life a little bit through the work that we might do. So a little bit of a menu of what you can expect um, to hear from, from us uh, in, in today's seminar. As I said, really, really pleased to, to get into the discussion at the end of it as well about your own thoughts and experiences also. So why collaborate in the first place? Um, I think Austin and Saitanidi describe it well when they talk about the, the complexity of the problems and the challenges that are facing us in, in, in societies that we're all living in, really transcending the, the responsibilities, capacities, capabilities of any single actor uh, or organisation or any sector of society working alone. It's really through the, the working together, the, the pooling of resources, the pooling of risks and talents and working across different sectors and organisations. It's, it's through that work that we believe that, that real change can be made when it comes to the complex problems that we're all facing. When we think about complex problems, I'm sure all of you will, will, will have your, your own challenges that you're working in through, through your own evaluative work. We think about things like, you know, climate change and, and, and poverty in communities and chronic disease prevention. It's really thorny complex problems that don't sit neatly within, within one sector, within the remit of one organisation. So it's really through uh, those, the, the pooling of resources that real progress against those challenges can be made. At the core uh, of, of, of all collaborative initiatives is, is really this idea of, of, of collaborative advantage, which I'm sure some of you will be familiar with and schooled in. And it's really that notion that uh, more can be achieved by working together than it can by working alone. Uh, so that it's, it's through the combining of our skills and talents and resources that we can do things better, more efficiently, more effectively uh, than perhaps what we might be able to do uh, as an entity working by itself. And that collaborative advantage really recognises, we think, that, that, that the benefits that both individual collaborators need to gain from the work that they might do within a collaboration, as well as that collective good that comes from uh, working collaboratively. You can see up there some of the other things that we might expect from a, a well-run collaborative effort. Uh, you can see that we might expect things to be more effective. Uh, we might be able to, to better invest our resources in order to, to be more effective in achieving the outcomes that we're seeking to generate. Through working in good collaborations, we might be able to use our resources more efficiently. Uh, some collaborations are about reach. Uh, we might be able to connect with more people in more places uh, through the skills and connections of different collaborators. 
And finally, collaborations enable us to deal with risk in different ways as well. We al they allow us to distribute risks uh, amongst different organisations and amongst different entities. They might also allow us to take on bigger and perhaps more ambitious risks than what we might do by ourselves. So just some of the reasons that might drive why we and others might find ourselves either in collaborations or seeking to get involved in collaborations. And that's obviously not, not, uh, not an exhaustive list. So if there's some of the reasons or drivers or motivation why we and others find ourselves in collaborations, what do we mean by this word of collaboration and, and how might it apply in, in, in the work that we're doing? I'm sure all of you will be familiar with all of these words that get used to describe collaborations, be they networks or alliances, communities, coalitions, consortiums, the list goes, goes on and on and on. We, like, like other folks, uh, would often use the word collaboration. I suppose it's more of an umbrella term that, that captures uh, some, of the, some of these other terms that then fit, fit, uh, fit within them. And they're all different in different ways, and I won't go into the, the details about how a network might be different from a coalition or the alliance, but they differ in terms of a range of different parameters. Um, they can differ in terms of their formality, for example, some partnerships can be really formal types of structures where there might be partnership agreements and contracts that exist uh, between different organisations or between different entities. And compare that to a network, for example, where it might be much looser, there isn't necessarily that formal agreement or contractual relationship that exists. Uh, that exists among, among members. So they can differ in terms of their formality. They'll differ in terms of their purpose, the reason why they exist and what they're seeking to change in the world. They'll differ in terms of their size. Some can be really big, some can be really small. The time horizons, again, some partnerships can have a very sort of enduring long-term vision about how long they're going to exist. Whereas other things like task forces, for example, might be formed in a more immediate form uh, that don't, they're not intended to exist for a very long period of time. There are much more shorter, uh, shorter form entities. They might differ in terms of the nature of the relationships so the things that are exchanged amongst and between different partners, be it knowledge, be it money, be it time, be it equipment, be it evidence or, or information. And they can differ in terms of the, the intensity of the, of the relationships that they contain. And again, I'm sure all of you will um, be thinking about the types of partnerships that perhaps you're in and, and the types of partnerships that you've been in as well. And some of them are super intense where you're meeting with, with partners on a really regular basis. You're almost working hand in glove with them. Well, other types of relationships that you might have with other folks through these different collaborative structures are much less frequent, much, much less intense and require much less of you. I think one of the important things that we remind ourselves often and as well is that more isn't necessarily better. Um, so there's this sort of overriding tendency to think within, within the literature and within partnerships and collaborations that we need to have more partners or stronger connections or deeper connections, more frequent connections, uh, when in actual fact what we know is that sometimes looser connections are much better. So it's really the purpose that will drive the, the form and function. And so one isn't better than another, they're just different. And that obviously has implications if we're thinking about what we might do as evaluators um, and how we might seek to learn about these types of things uh, when we're thinking about what, what they are, how they're structured. I wanted to, to give you just a couple of um, descriptions of how we might go about understanding or describing collaborations. And there's lots of different models, lots of different ways of understanding and talking about them. One of them is, is through sort of a life cycle then. Sometimes we think of partnerships, um, bang, here they are, they exist, all of a sudden we're in them and they're, they're, they're fully formed, they're fully structured and now they're doing something. Where in actual fact, we know that it takes time and energy uh, to build and broker and develop these types of collaborative structures. And so thinking about them through a life cycle uh, might be valuable, particularly in the context of performing. This particular model comes from the partnering initiative from a couple of years ago, and some of you I'm sure will be familiar with it. Uh, the beginning up there in that, that right-hand quadrant is really the, the beginnings of what, a, of what a partnership might look like. This is that scoping and building stage where we are uh, finding our feet, working out who we might partner with, what we might do together, uh, the kinds of uh, projects or initiatives we might work on together, uh, who those different entities might be. So that, that sort of early stage of sort of working out what the, what the foundations of this partnership are. As we move around that, so we then get into the, the managing and maintaining phase of, of, of partnering. This is really the, the doing of the work of partnership. And as Stuart mentioned, this is gained quite rightly lots of attention in terms of the, the folks that are working in partnership. 
So we're finding the right structures about how we might work in partnership. We might be uh, uh, delivering research projects, we might be implementing different services, we might be uh, going about doing the work uh, of what a partnership is doing, what a collaboration is doing. So that, that doing phase. The next phase on, on reviewing and revising, interestingly, is one of those phases that often just gets skipped over. So we spend so much time in working out the, the building, the broker, and the doing the partnership, we often just jump over this. Uh, but we think, and I'm, and I'm sure more, uh, uh, many folks on this call will think that this is actually a critical phase uh, for effective partnering. So this is where we do get to pause and reflect on the work of what a partnership is doing. Have we delivered what we wanted to deliver? Are the right partners at the table? Are we doing what we said we were going to do? What are we learning about the quality and strength of our relationships? And what is that? what are those relationships and enabling us to do that perhaps we couldn't do? by itself. So that reviewing and revising phase is a critical one. And that fourth phase around sustaining outcomes. Um, some partnerships um, can think of themselves as, as, as the existence of them is their success, so they want to endure forever, whereas other partnerships might, might get to the end of the work that they've done and say, okay, we've, we've done what we wanted to do and now we can, we can dissolve this partnership uh, and perhaps it might be reborn into something else or perhaps not. Um, but that third, that was that, that fourth and final phase is really that, that, that finishing that, that finishing point of have we done what we said we were going to do? Could we do more of it? Could we do less of it? What are we going to do in the future? So that's one way for understanding partnerships, which again might have implications for those of you that are very in evaluation or doing evaluation of partnerships. The second way we can think about partnerships, or a second way we can think about partnerships and, and, and understanding them is, is different types of partnerships. And again, lots of different typologies, and this is one. That, that you might have seen that might be useful for your work. And it essentially buckets partnerships into three different categories. The first one being about those that are leveraging and exchanging partnerships. So this might be where we're seeing partners coming together in order to exchange a set of resources. It might be knowledge, it might be information, it might be evidence. Importantly, for achieving their own strategic values. These are often transactional, short-term in nature types of relationships. You can think of something like a networking event or meeting or society that brings together people in research, for example, that might want to share their insights around a particular topic. You get a bit of information and you go away and do what you're going to do. It's one type of partnership. Combining and integrating, this is where we're seeing two or more organisations um, or entities that are bringing a uh, complementary set of resources uh, in order to do something that they can't necessarily do by themselves. See words around co-generation and mutual accountability, creating new things within these types of entities. You might, for example, see something like a, a funding agency and a research organisation and maybe a service delivery organisation coming together in order to test and scale uh, a, a, an early childhood program, for example. So combining a complementary set of resources in order to do something that they can't do themselves. The final type in, in, in this particular model are those that are called transformative uh, partnerships. And you can see by that word there, they're a bit more ambitious uh, than perhaps what some of these other partnerships might be. Um, again, we're seeing organisations with complementary sets of resources coming together, pooling those resources in order to do something that they can't do by themselves. Importantly, with these types of partnerships, what you sometimes find is that when they first come together, they don't necessarily know what it is that they might do. So there needs to be that time and space for uh, new ideas to form, innovations to take seed and to take root and to emerge from the work that they might do together. Three different types of partnerships that obviously have implications for how we might learn about them and what they do. And importantly, again, one isn't better than another, they're just different, but has implications for how we might learn about them. That might all sound very theoretical. Um, so I wanted to give you just a couple of examples of partnerships that we've worked with, that perhaps maybe some of you may have heard about, but that we've worked with over the years that, that fit into to some of these different categories. The first one is the Global Plastic Action Partnership, or GPAP. And GPAP is, as you can tell, uh, a global partnership that is focused on plastic pollution reduction, uh, removing plastic uh, from our oceans and waterways. So it operates at a global level, it operates at a national level, at regional levels, and all the way down to the local level as well. It's bringing together organisations from, from, from government sectors, from non-government organisations, from private sectors, from civil society. It's got a huge number of, 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 of partners and members that are now part of this partnership, more than 600 uh, now around the world. 
And it, it focuses on a whole range of different things. You can see some of the things that it's trying to do on the right hand side here. So it's, it's focusing on how can we go about transforming the behavior of consumers uh, as it relates to plastic purchasing and, and, and repurposing, recycling, and reuse, so things like campaigns, behavior change initiatives. It's seeking to inform policy of national governments where it has a footprint and where it has a set of relationships around plastic uh, reduction policies. It's seeking to, to boost innovation and supporting those that are involved in innovation and entrepreneurs within countries, helping them uh, identify innovations and scale them and spread them in different ways. Measuring plastic pollution is notoriously difficult and people use all sorts of different measures and metrics and tools in different places around the world. So one of the things that this partnership is doing is trying to find ways that you can better measure through a set of common metrics uh, plastic pollution reduction. It's seeking to help people access finance for the work that they're doing. And importantly, in the world of, of, of plastic pollution, particularly waste cooking, uh, we know that there are variable effects uh, felt by people of different genders. And so it's making sure that that lens of gender is included in the work of all of what the partnership is doing and of what, uh, and of what partners are doing in local countries. So an example, perhaps, of a more transformative partnership, which is seeking change at multiple levels in multiple places and through a range of different means and mechanisms. Another example, perhaps, on the, the more um, combining, integrating, or leveraging, exchanging type of partnerships is the Knowledge Development Exchange Hub uh, in Child and Youth Mental Health. This is a, a hub which is based in Canada uh, and it's a pan Canadian hub, and it's seeking to bring together researchers, policymakers, and practitioners that all have shared interests around child and youth mental health promotion, which is an emerging field within Canada and, and elsewhere as well. So this hub has really been formed, the hub's a good name for it, it's really been formed as a, as a, a shared space by which all of those different folks from those different research policy and practice orientations can, can come together and to share their insights around what works as it relates to promoting uh, positive mental wellbeing of children and youth. So this hub has a particular role around supporting people to, to generate knowledge. So it's providing resources to enable people to do that. It's providing a home to exchange that knowledge between researchers, but also from researchers to, to practitioners and policymakers to ensure that there's a, a, a mechanism and a pathway for connecting knowledge with action. It's seeking to build strong connections and relationships, again, amongst those people that are part of the research community, but also amongst those that are outside of that community. And it's increasing access to a range of different resources as well, be they, be they financial resources, helping people access resources they need for the work that they do, but also accessing different resources they might need for designing, for example, the study they might be in. So an example of a different type of partnership, again, that would have implications for the types of evaluations we might do moving forward. So if that's the kind of why we might collaborate, what collaboration is, and, and some examples of the different ways that we can think about them, um, what do we know about how to collaborate effectively? And I won't spend too long on this because I want to hand over to you in a moment, but the literature, as for those of you that are steeped in it, um, will recognise that it, it kind of abounds with with these critical success factors of what we need for, for effective partnerships and, and platforms and coalitions and alliances. Um, 10 of them uh, you can see up there on the screen. These aren't necessarily exhaustive, but these are critical and what we see repeatedly over and over again in the literature. So a shared vision and mission um, being a foundational element of what we need for a strong and effective collaboration. Are we going in the same direction? Do we have sufficient alignment between our own goals and the goals we might achieve together in order for us to stay in. So shared vision and mission being critical. Distributed leadership, so recognising that uh, authority and skills and expertise might lie in different places within a collaborative structure, so making sure there's a space and room for that leadership to, to take place. Accountability and commitment that there are clear and transparent structures that we're all, we're all aware of what each partner is doing and we hold ourselves and each other accountable to commitments that we Financial strength and making sure that there is enough financial energy and, and momentum behind the work of this partnership that it can actually deliver on what it says it's going to deliver. Trust and goodwill, something which isn't necessarily there right at the beginnings of many collaborative ventures, but something which is built and earned over, over time spent working with people. Clear governance structures uh, that are in place, and again, that are transparent to, to folks that we can see how decisions are made within this particular collaborative structure. 
inclusivity, so making sure that those voices and perspectives that need to be part of what, um, uh, that are affected by the decisions of what a partnership or collaboration is doing, that those voices and perspectives are foundational and included within the work of the collaboration. Reciprocity, mutual benefit, so that, that the, the energy that has been put into the work of being in partnership, recognising that there's a huge cost for many folks, but they're getting something out of it. Um, often we like to gloss over uh, the idea of, of, of our own self-interest within partnerships, and yet it's critical that, that partners are able to gain things from working in partnership uh, in ways that they value and are meaningful to them. Not to say that that has to be the same or equal for all partners, but it has to be of meaning and value to those people that are living there. And finally, this is the one that I haven't, haven't mentioned, but continuous learning and evaluation, and Nick's going to talk about this in just a moment, but something which we see as being critical to high-performing and high-functioning partnerships is an investment in, in learning and evaluation, making that front and centre in terms of the work that they do, so that they're able to uh, assess where they've come from, assess where they're going, to, to describe the difference that they're making in the work that they do. So a little bit about partnerships I hope is useful for, for sort of context setting and background before we now start talking about all the so what of all of that for, for from an evaluation perspective. I'm going to stop, stop sharing my screen for just a moment and it's going to share his and then we can come back to some questions at the end. Thanks, Cam. Hi everyone. Um, nice to see so many people here and, and interested in um, in something uh, that we're we're really passionate about, which is this uh, learning and evaluation in platforms and partnerships. Um, I think Cam gave a really good overview there. It doesn't stop the amount of time you do this and the amount of work you do in it. You still kind of find out new things um, and different perspectives. So I appreciate going back to the theory. Sometimes it's useful. Um, as Cam said, I'm going to talk a little bit about this why invest in learning and evaluation. I suppose I probably don't have to convince all of you why to invest in learning and evaluation because that's what we are here in evaluation society. Um, but I think there's some really key principles and ideas that are, that are relevant to um, platforms and partnerships. So I think Stuart said this actually right up the front. There's a lot of effort that goes into um, the processes of partnering, you know, how to build them, what do you do? Who do you, who do you get to be part of it? How often do you meet? Who's in charge of decision-making? And there's lots of ideas around um, how do we make them stronger and better and, um, and work for more people. But what we've noticed certainly, and I imagine lots of you have as well, is that there's comparatively kind of less energy that's put into learning about them. So about what the partnership achieves, um, what they achieve for its members, what they achieve for the world, what they achieve for collaboration. And there's, um, yeah, there's just a lot less energy that goes into it. And of course, we're really interested in this learning um, space. So, this is not an exhaustive list, but some ideas around what could be some of those benefits of learning and evaluation within collaborative initiatives or entities under whatever name they fall under as CAM gives a list of alliances and coalitions before. So I suppose, and this is probably a pretty obvious one, but the first is that it might, might allow you to, pro, to um, kind of chart progress achievements um, and, and the things that are happening or the benefits that are accruing, um, whatever they may be for the partnership or for for the world. Um, as, as with all kinds of evaluation and all kinds of um, learning instruments, I suppose, they, you, they can create products to talk about what you did. Um, and they, that could help you support efforts to kind of secure further funding. So you can use it to advocate on behalf of the work that you've done and the work that you might need more support with. And we find it opens up new conversations. So this idea around wanting to attract new partners or wanting to have um, different people within the mix. So ideas around, oh, this, is, this is what's happening here. So we tried this thing out and it's, and it's going well, or we tried this thing out and we're gonna stop it now. And we do see this as a, as a device for bringing on new team members or existing team members, keeping them up to speed. Not everyone's interested in learning and evaluation, but most people are interested in what they're working on. Um, I suppose then that, that kind of links to that increasing um, attention from prospective partners. And we do lots of work with supporting partnerships to you know, identify who they want to work with and how they're going to get them and how they're going to attract them. And so some of these, um, these learning materials can actually help you increase that attention and get the right partners in the room. We, we would hope, I suppose, as evaluators, as people who work in learning and evaluation, that, that all of this stuff impro improves decision-making, that people actually use it for decision-making, that they allow partners to kind of reflect on what's happening, to learn from what's happening and to change um, course as need be. Um, and finally, I suppose this is maybe a, 
maybe an interest of ours is that it, you know we don't know enough about how partnerships and collaborations work we don't know enough about uh, what are the things that they are that collaborative advantage is is contributing to the world so in a kind of um i suppose in a, in a, in a useful way all of the efforts in learning and evaluation contribute to a greater knowledge about how collaboration works um, can mention this up front, the kinds of things that we can evaluate, and this is in the context, obviously, of collaborative initiatives, there's lots of things we can evaluate in the world. Um, we've broken it up into, into, a, into a structure, I suppose, or I shouldn't say structure because it says structure on the slide, but we've broken it up into kind of a typology of things that you could choose to evaluate within a partnership. Um, there's, there's lots of other things you could as well, and there's lots of other ways to think about this, but for the purposes of today, we'll talk about structure, process, and outcomes. And I'm going to talk about these in, 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 in the context of what um, you could evaluate within those three buckets, and then the ways in which we've seen um, uh, different evaluators or partnerships start to imagine how they um, could evaluate them. So it won't be exhaustive, but some ideas and things that we've seen along the way. Um, and so we thought, because we're talking with all of you, you'll, you'll all be pretty um, uh, used to developing kind of example evaluation questions or, or research questions that go into these endeavours. So we thought to structure it around some questions today. When we're in kind of the structure space within a collaborative initiative, we're thinking about uh, to what extent have you got the, the right voices um, or the necessary voices or the correct voices present within there. So, so have you got the right people there? Um, how are they connected and how are you enabling those connections um, between them? So uh, Cam was talking before about stronger, deeper uh, connections that might not be what you want, but we're thinking about the nature and quality of those relationships. And then, um, and then how they access and required resources. So um, have they got uh, I don't know, the, right, the right structures and governance processes? Have they got the right backing behind them? Have they got the right platforms to meet on? Have they, are they collecting the right information? So some ideas around um, approaches that we've seen work really well. There's that kind of upfront stuff around stakeholder analysis, systems mapping, the kind of landscaping work that is really critical to establishing a collaborative initiative. Um, and particularly in the context of a collaboration, which you've got lots of actors in, you know, you want to you figure out, well, who, who are these people? How are they all connected? Have we got the right ones? Are there more to add in? Um, so that kind of, that, that beginning state. But I would say that we also return to stakeholder analysis and systems mapping um, with partnerships at different stages of development, because of course, taking stock of who you've got and who you might have next is really important as well. Um, there's that network analysis type work, which is um, which is ongoing, I think, but also about something that exists. You know, there's this um, this this partnership and how the network has formed and what it's generating, um, how people are interacting, um, and of course resource mapping too to understand what kind of things you might need to allocate to um, to better or improve this um, this entity. So. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this process um, slide because this is where lots and lots of work goes into um, evaluating partnerships. And if you've been involved in partnership evaluations in the past, you might have seen um, some examples of process type evaluations that um, that really kind of yeah link to um, link to understanding the, yeah, the processes of how people collaborate, basically. So Cam mentioned some of those critical success factors before, and often these are the things that we're thinking about or starting points anyway for thinking about process. So you know, a good collaboration will need to have a or many shared goals um, that guide the work of the collaboration. And so it's important really to understand the process by which collaborators or actors within the collaboration arrive at that shared goal and have they arrived at it and are they continuing to go back to it? And that leads to that second question there around how, how they hold each other to account for the processes and the mechanisms by which they do that and also how effective that mutual accountability is. We, we see often with lots of partnerships that um, we talk about accountability, but perhaps we don't hold each other to account very well. Um, wouldn't it be great if we used all of this uh, learning and evaluation for decision making or for improving decision making processes? I'm sure you can all um, relate to the times we don't see that happening, but it can, it, evaluating how decisions are made within a collaboration, whether they're inclusive or transparent, representative, drawing from different voices and values within the group is, is really important and, and tells you a lot about the strength and I suppose um, the nature of the collaboration. Um, 
we work with kind of complex, Cam Rich and GPAP before, and that's one that's on my mind. We work with these kind of entities who are working on lofty goals, really. You know, how do we remove all of the plastic in the ocean? How do we stop it happening anymore? And then there are changing circumstances that will, that will occur over time. So how does this collaborative initiative respond to those extraneous environmental things? So, you know, has someone actually come up with a policy to stop making plastic go into the ocean or have, have different actors um, committed to different things? So is the collaboration prepared to respond to those things? Does it do it well? Is it still placed um, well to kind of respond to its changing circumstances? Um, and that final question there about the overall health of the collaboration, I mean, there's, there's lots of li literature on this. And if you're into collaboration and partnerships, um, it's kind of fun to delve into. I don't know if it is fun or if it's just nerdy, but it's the health of a collaboration is kind of a, a great thing. You know, you can see um, lots of these things exist because they have to, because we're told that collaborating is the right way to do things. But a really healthy collaboration has an amazing opportunity to contribute um, to contribute real good to the world, I suppose. So um, the health of the collaboration is important. And that includes the ways in which people are interacting with one another, um, the ways they feel about one another, the ways they feel about the work that they're doing, their, um, their commitment to it, et cetera. Um, so there's different ways to do this. I'm not gonna um, go into a huge amount of detail here, but, but they do, that there's, you, you might have seen things like partnership health assessments or collaborative tools for assessing your health. I'm saying health twice, but they all say health mostly. Um, and they're really good. They're really useful tools for understanding things about the structure and process of your collaborative initiative. Um, there's lots out there and they, and they are really useful. It says there on that third bullet point there that they're around those critical success factors. You know, Do you have shared goals? Are you sharing resources, authority and accountability? Um, how are you engaging with the systems that you want to operate within or shift or change? How's communication flowing, information sharing? Are you adaptive? Are you responsive? Um, all of those kinds of things. And they're, they're, they're really interesting because that, they are the backbone of kind of collaborative work. Um, in terms of methodologically uh, or tools and approaches, they do rely heavily on survey um, or the gathering of kind of, uh, of the feelings of um, feelings and expressions and experiences of, um, of the actors within the collaboration. And we have found them to be really valuable tools for, um, for tracking, as I said, those critical success factors. However, and there's, there's, here's my linking, my linking point to my next slide, few of these tools um, actually document the outcomes of the collaborative initiative. So I'm gonna try and draw this together with, um, with the examples Cam gave before. But we were thinking about this in preparation for the um, for for this session with you today, and and there's I suppose we we've split it into two groups. There's there's kind of these individual outcomes and their shared outcomes. So the individual outcome questions um, might be about how how has being part of this collaboration influenced my, me as I'm part of it, or how has it influenced one the, the people within it, and what benefits have those individual partners or collaborators collaborators gained from working together um, and in what ways has that contributed to the to the system of interest and that last question is really around that um, how does it collaborate to the systems that people are operating within and the changes in the world um, that this collaboration might be seeking to um, to do something about and so we were just thinking about some of the some of those particular outcomes that you might um, begin to assess, I suppose, or evaluate for members. So those individual level outcomes. Um, so it might they might relate to to mission. Um, so have you has it increased your ability to directly or indirectly achieve your organisational mission? So to give you an example, within the um, GPAP um, uh, example that Cam gave before, actors come from you know. The private, public, and civil society sectors, and and often um, uh, participation within a platform like that is is through an organisational lens or perspective. So you know you might have a plastic manufacturer or um, or a government agency that's that's tasked with removing plastic, and so you know if you, if one of the outcomes could be that the members themselves are able to um, to change the organization's missions that they work in and and the organization as in the collaboration that's a really that's a really great thing to have and, and a great thing to kind of watch how it's happening um, and I suppose in an organizational level uh, are they able then to leverage resources within the um, 
within the, uh, the working environments that they operate in outside of the partnership and are they together able to leverage resources together? So kind of both of those things at once. And, and this is the, th the last bullet point there is the thing that we see most about people's participation in, in collaborative entities. You know, they, there's these always intangible things that, that you know you, you want to get from being part of it, but you're not really sure if you're going to get it and if it's successful, you get it because it fits what you want. But anyway, the things are, um, you know, those social political capital, people join private public platforms because they want access to government or they want access to a company and vice versa. That, that, that's what they want. And they both know that they're there for that. They have this opportunity for networking, connecting to one another in deeper ways and, in, and on kind of shared issues together. And that's a really important joining thing. It's, you know, if, if you're like me and you hate networking, these are great ways to network around um, something that you're actually interested in. Um, they obviously, the increased legitimacy thing I think is really interesting because we see it in lots of these kind of complex problems where people join a platform where there's a whole lot of people interested, I'm going to go back to the plastic one, and then they're able to say, actually, there's all these other people that are interested in plastic as well, so there's some, um, there's some good, there, this is a legitimate thing to be interested in, obviously, reputational benefits, market advantage. Influence and positioning. Um, the influence and positioning one is a double-edged sword, of course, um, because sometimes people um, are authentically committed to being part of platforms and sometimes they're there for uh, the influence and positioning power that it may give them within their organisational entities. Um, I think these are interesting too. We kind of, we came up with these as, um, as uh, I suppose, a typology. What are some of those shared outcomes that we see coming from uh, these partnerships. Mm, they, this, is, this is not exhaustive, but these are some of the things that we see. So they, they, they try to influence policy, you know, they try to advocate and lobby and softly influence and talk about and shift policy. Um, the collaborative entity, I mean, when I say they, um, they have benefits for practice. So they, the knowledge development and exchange hub that Cam was mentioning for child and youth mental health, you know, one of its benefits is that it's a, it's a place that shares practice um, around what works, what isn't working, how could it work better um, in that space and so procedures, guidelines, routines, things that things that could actually um, improve the practice within that space. Um, hopefully, and I think this is this is true, we see we see different kind of resources um, uh, committed to um, uh, to working on these grand endeavors together. And I mean like really, really tangible things like we see funders at the table and committing um, you know, large amounts of money to try and solve these complex problems. And we also see people who wouldn't usually be there um, at the table committing their time and energy and those resources are really important. And we talked about relationships before, but you know, it can't be a bad thing to have better, better collaboration and better cross-working between disparate groups. And we see that as a benefit, um, as an outcome for the world. Probably the, I mean, this is a, something that we're really passionate about, but this dismantling of power, this, this idea that you can use um, a collaborative entity to bring in unheard voices um, that, that aren't usually there and give them decision making uh, power and authority and responsibility and um, yeah, be in the room where it happened. Oh, that was that a quote? That's a, that's a terrible, sorry, Cam went saw Hamilton last week and so I've got it in my head, but it, you know, get people in the room where it happens. And I suppose um, also it's, it is about shifting attitudes, values and beliefs, you know, being part of something and hearing from others that have different view, viewpoints to you, um, arriving at a kind of shared goal, outcome, ambition is a really important thing uh, to get us all kind of thinking, perhaps not on the same page, but challenging one another and, um, and challenging our own attitudes, values and beliefs. Okay, does a whistle stop tour between, well, of, of all the, of all, of, of a culmination of work that we've done for years, but I thought I'd drill it down uh, into some suggestions and recommendations that we have found useful when approaching learning and evaluation in the collaborative space. Um, here's one we prepared earlier. Um, and it, it, it is something we prepared earlier and something we've put a lot of time into. It's a distillation of, of our work, I suppose, around what we've, what we've started calling these five ingredients for learning and evaluation uh, within collaboration. So Cam mentioned that before, the first thing we find is critical is to set a clear and shared vision. That's a shared vision for the platform and partnership, and it's a shared vision for uh, the learning and evaluation that wants that that needs to happen uh, within that space so that might be in the form of, of an evaluation plan or any other 
um, terminology to it, but it is it has to include both a shared and cleared vision for the platform and a shared and cleared vision for collecting information uh, and for evaluating progress. So then, then there is something really tangible about a data collection plan. And when you've got a whole lot of people um, coming from lots of different places, preparation and planning for this we see is really critical. Uh, you miss lots of intangible benefits when you don't collect information from those conversations that are happening in hallways or whatever. Although we're all in Zoom still, so maybe on Zoom in breakout rooms. Um, develop, so sharing, reporting, communicating what's happening. So how are we going to do it? Where are we going to get it from? Who's it, who's it going to? All of those kinds of I suppose, communications, knowledge sharing, those, those important um, aspects need to be decided up front. There's something that we find really, uh, what's the word, like a really great way in around agreeing indicators. So um, often collaborations aren't very good at talking about what it is that they do and what they achieve as collaborations. So indicators that are about collaboration uh, rather than about the big lofty goals are really important to arrive at in addition to those big lofty goals so that you can track the health and instruction process of your collaboration. And finally, and I don't really know if we've ever nailed this completely, but there needs to either exist a culture of inquiry or there needs to be a group of people that are interested in building a culture of inquiry because learning is about wanting to find something out, to be inquisitive, to, um, to learn about what we don't know yet. And that's a really important backbone of these, um, these evaluation approaches, I suppose, for collaborations. So you, could, you can summarise it or I can summarise it for you, but um, the, the, I suppose four things we'd hope you would take away from today. So there's, there's something for us that, that learning and evaluation are critical to these things. So it's, it's one thing just to say, yep, go ahead and, and create partnerships. It's the only way to do work and we must all work together. Um, but I think what we would say is that you, if you're going to do that, also learn about why it's working for you. Why is it important? Find out, um, find out the things you didn't know before and share them with others because collaborative initiatives take energy, they take work, um, and, they, and there's a lot of people in them too. So you've got, got to kind of commit to it. Structure, process, outcomes are all relevant, as I hopefully have outlined to you. Um, and, and having a focus on all three is really important from the outset, not just outcomes, particularly in a collaborative um, entity like this, or like these that we're talking about. Um, don't start with tools and approaches. Uh, that would be, if I could, if I could say that to any to anyone who works in these, these spaces, that don't start with the way you're going to do it, start with the other questions, you know, arrive at the tools and approaches and methods last. Um, and finally, I've said this before, this culture of inquiry, try and instill it, you know, what are we going to learn from how, how can we change our practice? How can we actually make um, make change or impact on some of these huge, thorny, complex issues. I think that's it. I've, we said half an hour. I, that was that was not half an hour. That was a, that was a, that was longer. But um, thank you all for your patience. I'm going to stop talking and, and hand it over for questions. Thanks, Nick, and yeah, thanks, Cam. That's just um, there's so much there that's so fascinating, and. Um, yeah, I'm not surprised you talked longer as well, because you, as you said, it was, was a whistle stop tour. There's so much there to cover. And you've also gone beyond, I think, um, evaluation too. So um, some questions coming up through here in the chat now. Um, I mean, uh, Christabel, would you like to talk to your question uh, about negative consequences, which is, yeah, quite interesting. I'm happy to ask the question as well. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Sorry. Yeah, so thank you so much, Nick and Cameron. That was fantastic. Um, I, I, I'm really interested, you know, as you've been on this journey with a few different organisations, have you seen some common themes or lessons learned about when is it perhaps not ideal to collaborate? Um, some of the lessons learned are the negative consequences of, of collaboration. Really interested in your thoughts. Or should we always just collaborate? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I've got one to mind, Cam, from today's conversation, uh, and I'm sure you'll have others. That the main one that comes to mind for me, Christabel, is um, about uh, collaboration being done to people. So an example is a funder insists that you must collaborate in order to get the money, but you're actually all working on the same thing where you were going to work on separate things, but now you have to work together competing for the same fund and sometimes collaboration has negative consequences when it brings people together that should be genuinely not 
sharing resources or having to share resources um, and are forced into a space where they where they must do that in order to to appease someone else so yeah i see some uh, resource, resource sharing when it's not done from for the right reasons is, is a huge negative consequence and, and 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 i suppose just to add to that and i everybody on this call will have found themselves in working in a collaboration which wasn't very good it didn't feel very good to be part of it um, there are multiple consequences come from that, that that come from being in difficult relationships, aren't there? You know, like it it erodes trust. Um, it removes our ability to to find a common pathway forward. It removes our ability to actually be willing uh, to, to to share our resources in ways that allow us to do something together effectively. So collaborations, when done badly, end up in um, a, a lack of a lack of an ability to partner effectively. Um, and then, then we don't get to realise the benefits of doing that. So as, as, as good as they can be, as, as bad as they can be as well. I think the other thing just to add, add to that as well is that sometimes there's this, um, we, we had sort of a, a, a very lockstep perception about what we will get from collaboration. You know, we've got a set of indicators or a set of outcomes or a set of things we want to see change in the world. One of the things that I think we find most importantly um, about these types of entities is that things come from them that are a bit unexpected. And so being open to um, uh, those unanticipated effects that can come from collaboration, be they good, be they bad, is really important to hold in our hands as we're approaching the, the work that they do. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, lots more questions and uh, a lot of really affirming comments coming through the chat. So um, probably we'll focus more on some of the questions coming through. Um, Angela, you have a question here about um, indicators um, and data. Um, did you want to talk to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so just earlier you mentioned um, that mainly the data for evaluation will come from surveys or so talking to people that are part of these collaborations. Um, so I guess in that way, the nature of the data is perception-based. So it's based on perceptions that people in these collaborations have about the processes, but also the outcomes. And I guess then obviously people have different levels, different perceptions, and, and they will um, you know, consider say an outcome um, different or, um, yeah, we'll perceive it in a different way that, uh, that others will. So I guess then that best the question of how can you arrive at an objective measure for mm. uh, outcomes? Uh, I guess that in my work, that's a question I always sort of have to uh, tackle yeah. with. Good question, Angela. Um, I, I, I remember the, the bit that I was talking about. I was talking about it in the context um, survey, in the context of um, collaborative health assessments, which are are tools um, that have been developed and are largely survey tools. So just to clarify, that's what I said. So that those and those things exist and they've and they've been um, kind of tested, I suppose, and and um, and, ma and made into something that people can use. So and they're really good for understanding, as you say, the perceptions of people within the collaboration, how those processes and structures are working for them. Um, when we get to outcomes, we use all different kinds of sources um, and data sources, I suppose. Uh, it depends, depends what it is that you're looking for as an outcome, but, um, but certainly don't just rely on survey. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know really how to answer your question without a particular um, focus on a, on a collaboration or, or a particular set of outcomes, but depending on the outcomes that people are seeking, we use a range of different methods and we would see a range of different methods used by the collaborations to understand what they're doing as well. Okay, another, it's a really interesting, I guess, meta question here from Rachel. Um, yeah, did you want to talk to this, Rachel? I, I think you can probably do it better justice than that, me reading it out. Uh, sure, happy to. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in evaluation of collaborations that are actually an intervention in and of themselves. I just wonder if you might be able to speak to uh, the subject of, of what types of approaches you might use if they are indeed different to the ones that you've covered um, for tackling evaluation of collaborations that are an intervention. Could you, um, sorry, just maybe it's my naivety, um, Rachel, but I'm kind of, could you describe what a, what a collaboration as an intervention might be? 
Um, there are um, there are interventions. Um, there are collaborations that are that are created in order to solve problems. So mm -hmm. um, a problem exists, and the solution might be to actually get people to work together better um, and oh, share yeah. resources. Um, that that would be just a, a high level description mm -hmm. of, of the kinds of things I'm referring to. Well, my colleague, uh, Dr. Willis, uh, has, has been writing about this. I'm going to throw that to you, Cameron, because this meta question is something we've been trying to play with recently, hasn't it? I think that there's, it, it, it's a really good question and it's kind of viewing, in, in some ways, um, viewing the, the collaboration as, as the end goal in itself. Um, and mm. so has this collaboration actually been able to um, uh, bring folks together that, that it intended to do? Has it been able to forge strong and meaningful relationships between these entities that are part of the collaboration? What is it that these, that these folks are now exchanging through their relationships that perhaps they wouldn't have exchanged before? Has it enabled them to build trust and new relationships with those that they were seeking for those that, that the collaboration was intending to seek? So in many ways, if those are, I, I think it, it, it's, if, if those are the intentions of what um, the intervention was seeking to do, then I think it's, it's sort of, it, it's on us as evaluators and learners to, to explore, has it actually achieved those things? I think the other thing to add, to that. And so then some of them, the methods you, you can, you can um, imagine the kinds of approaches you'd use to, to capture some of that information. Sometimes though, it's, it's through those relationships that then perhaps other things are expected to come out of it. Maybe for example, it's through those new connections that have been formed that um, two people that maybe hadn't met each other before might go off and do a project together. Perhaps they wouldn't have, have been able to do that otherwise. And they might form, there might be new spin-off initiatives that come as a result of their relationship that they're formed through a particular collaboration. So sometimes it's important to understand the nature of the relationship, if indeed that's been the thing that the collaboration has been trying to do. Absolutely understand that. And sometimes those relationships have either an explicit or implicit intention to do something off the back of their formation. And so it would be important to try to capture those as well. Helen, you had your hand up earlier. Did you have a question? I have, um, <clears throat> and then I started coughing and I had to take my hand <laughs> um, uh, My question relates to, uh, it's a kind of, um, it, it sounds a bit slightly frivolous, but when I was thinking about um, evaluating outcomes and I was thinking about collaborations that I've worked in where the collaboration was terrific and the actual achievement of, an, of a tangible outcome at the end was zero. Um, everyone very happy with the collaboration, but making very little difference to the issue at hand. And I guess um, my question is and would be for my future, the projects that I'm involved with at the moment, is linking those two. So I think there is an assumption that the collaboration in and of itself is a good thing um, and, should, and should, in theory, produce some good outcomes. But there is not necessarily, in my experience, a link between the collaboration working quite well and the outcome, which is unmoved. unmoved. It might be just too big, too wicked, too, um, you know, too many variables. I'm not sure, but... That, yeah, as you said, uh, I mean, that, that is something that obviously that's hopefully what we hopefully started to get across today as well as like we see a lot of effort being put into the, the health of the partnership and the way that mm -hmm. um, people are working together. And, and as I said before, there's lots of really good tools for doing that as well. Um, mm -hmm. I, I see what you mean about, I, I've, I've got some examples of partnerships that are really healthy that don't do anything in the world as well. But, um, but I think that where I would, where I would um, kind of connect the two of outcomes and the health of a partnership is um, something that we've seen is that they are, they are the foundations or critical success factors of uh, achieving outcomes. So um, I'm trying to be, be clear about it. If you've got all of those critical success factors in place. If people are in a healthy partnership, then they are more likely to achieve those outcomes. And I, I do think there is there is merit in, in, um, in looking at the health of the partnership or the ways in which people are working rather than just focusing on those outcomes, because at the same time as, you know, you have partnerships that are really healthy that achieve no outcomes, you have partnerships that are really unhealthy that are achieving the wrong outcomes mm. or unintended outcomes. So um, yeah, I would say that like, 
having maybe it's not a separate system, but a way of appreciating the foundational element of those um, those partnership qualities, I guess. Um, yeah, I, and, I think and that's that sounded a bit negative. No, no, Sorry, no, no, it sounded no, no. A bit it's not it's, It wasn't particularly negative in the sense that by the time we had all finished looking at the issue, we realised we had not understand the enormity of the issue, mm, and mm. and therefore we had actually we had actually got more knowledge than we originally understood. Um, and so our, I think that whole thing about curiosity and learning is mm. fantastic. I mean, we, we were all incredibly daunted by the end of it because we kind of went, shit, we didn't understand this at all. And now mm. I think we've got to recalibrate this and we have to bring mm. to be other things on this and it's not just us. So mm. it, was, it, was a, it was a good process. Um, and I think, yeah, just we would take back to the drawing board. So it was actually a quite positive. But um, I don't. I think it, unless someone had pulled that together for the group, they would have just continued to have to feel good about the collaboration and mm. achieve not much. Mm. And there's something as well, Helen. Just listening to you talk, there, there can be this mismatch, can't there, between some of our expectations of what we want mm. a collaboration to deliver um, or what we're told that it will deliver mm. and then what it actually does. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, I think we see that all the, all the, the time. Um, and what we do, what we, what we have a tendency to do is actually to miss the value that a collaboration has actually generated. Mm. So when you say it was a really good collaboration, I, I hear one of the things I hear in that it, it was it was really nice to be part of the collaboration. So it was a, it was friendly, it was welcoming, it was respectful. There was good relationships and good exchanges between people. That that's a nice thing. But yet, what it actually results in, as you just said, then um, you know we, we got new knowledge, we got new insights, we got new um, information about the problem that we were dealing with. That doesn't sound like it was necessarily the intention at the start of what the collaboration was seeking to do, and yet it's come from that. And sometimes our really rigid evaluation structures and approaches don't necessarily allow us to capture that difference that gets made. So holding space that you can capture that um, is critically important. Yeah, that's fascinating, Cameron. Um, it reminds me, I, I couldn't help thinking that that quote, that evaluation grew up in the projects and um, so many of the approaches that we use are just not all that well um, suited to um, what you're talking about. And there's probably room, there's a, that's a whole other discussion. Um, Jane, you've got your hand up there um, and uh, you've been active in the chat too. So yes, far away. Hi, yes. Um, my, my question ties in with... Um, a question that Claire Hanley also asked, which relates to complex um, programs where you've got multiple components. So um, in Claire's case, it was a, a program of 40 sub projects and uh, nine funded agency, agencies. Uh, in my context, it's um, um, a single program with 20 funded agencies are all doing different things uh, with some sort of nebulous expectation that collaboration partnerships are going to be a part of their funded activities. But, um, and this is a program that has happened. And so our task as evaluators, given that, that at the inception or the guidelines for this program, uh, with such a sort of a nebulous expectation that somehow partnerships are a part of what gets done. But how do you, you know, have you had experiences um, with that? And I think Claire's was more at the form, of, you know, at the start of it, of started that process, whereas I'm more at the other end of going, okay, you know, how, how do we sort of evaluate something where there was never any sort of like with respects to partnerships, it was, there was never any real sort of like, we want you to do a part, we want you to form partnerships mm. uh, to help you deliver your funded activity. So that was never explicitly stated. Yeah, I, I think there's lots of examples of what you're describing. Um, one of the things that's coming to my mind is sometimes we talk about like, you know, a multi-site, multi-agency, multi-project um, thing. And then, and they call it collaboration because it's you know under one funding or under seven funders or whatever it is. And I think there's a difference between um, between collaboration as a grouping. So um, you know, there's lots of lots of things together that fall under one um, I don't know, theme. Uh, versus, um, are are these parties expected to actually 
intersect and work together. So whether just because they're working on the same thing, uh, you know, and they and they're funded by the same agency, I would say isn't always the best sign of them being a collaboration. I'm thinking, and I've de definitely seen some of these where that where it's said, I was like, and and can you tell us how our collaborative funding worked? Which is also a different question, isn't it? It's how how did how did the funding um, collaborate? Or how did the funders collaborate? But I suppose in answer to your question, when you see those things um, and, and whatever structure they come in, I think when applying some of the things we've talked about today, and again, not exhaustive, it's about drawing those boundaries of, of what, what are people, how are people collaborating? What are they collaborating about? Um, why are they collaborating? Are they even collaborating in the first place? Or was it just the word being used? Um, mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I, I think those are probably good starting places because, and I'm just, the, the, the projects that are coming to mind for me that we've worked on are the ones that also want to know about the 40 sub projects and um, and all of the nine and what each nine agencies have put into, um, to put into this and what they got out of it. So, there's a kind of, as Stuart was saying before, there's kind of like a project-based evaluation within a collaboration evaluation that's um, uh, that can really confuse matters as well. Mm. So, yeah, I think it, it, making sure that you focus on the collaboration as well, if there was a collaboration at all. Mm. There's, there's also, just in your question, Jane, it just made me think about this, um, this offhand way in which many of us, some of us, um, have a, a seen collaborations and partnerships referred to, you know, like it, it and, and in, in what it does is it, it kind of, um, it devalues the amount of time and effort and energy um, of what it takes to go into uh, building and working in its successful collaborative structures, be they partnerships or alliances, whatever the word is, but the, the, it, it's almost a throwaway line that, of course, people will form partnerships and there'll be collaborations and et cetera, et cetera. And yet the amount of effort it takes to do that well uh, is, is, is really significant. So there's just something for me about, and maybe it's something we can all do in our practice as well, is that if there is an intention to, to build and broker partnerships or partnerships is something that we want some initiatives to, to engage, that we actually elevate that and make that visible and recognise um, in an authentic way, what it takes to, to, to work in collaboration and to make sure that we're capturing the investments that people are making in that collaborative work because it can be significant. Yeah, I must, I must say that's actually what you've just talked about. There's been a reflection of must, uh, like a reflection that I've had as I've um, gone over the data and, and the, um, that absolutely, uh, developing partnership creation or development you know is 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 a project in its own right let alone when you conflate it with a, a broader programs um, goals and somehow partnership creation and development sort of subsumed under other goals and just there's an mm. assumption that this just happens mm. and it doesn't just happen and much effort and time and resourcing needs to be put in by the organisations. And a lot of these organisations are very small organisations. Yeah, and, and Jane, you're, I'm, reading, I'm reading your question now alongside your comments there. And I'm reminded of, um, and I think I said it a little way before, but funders often um, you know, set up like a collaborative scheme or a collaborative funding scheme, or they, they aim to fund collaboration. And as you say, people are a resource um, scarce aren't they so there's there's an opportunistic ism uh to these people c c combining efforts and putting in a bid and then they've got a program that's suddenly about collaboration and then at the end of it they say how'd the collaboration go it's like oh no i was just trying to get the money um and i think we we see we see that a lot i imagine lots of us do as evaluators um i think the onus then is as you said jane back on the back on the funder did they create space and opportunity for people to collaborate within their funding scheme and if not, why not? Um, that could be part of, form part of the evaluation, I think, or at least mm. part of the feedback to them. Absolutely. Thank you. Nice. Would anyone else like to um, talk to some of the questions that have gone into the chat? I, I, I am interested in Melanie's question about um, any recommended insights or approaches for evaluating cross-cultural collaborations.
I'm just trying to read the. Could Melanie? Could you? Would you mind saying it? I'm just trying to find it in the yeah, chat. Yeah, there's a lot of questions there. Hi guys, thanks for the talk. Yeah, um, so I work with um, um, uh, into in supporting a lot of um collaborative, I guess um partnerships and committees and working groups between um traditional owner groups and um, their partners. So that might be government agencies um, or other, um, um, other organizations that they'll work with. Um, so a lot of the time there's, you know, big cultural differences in, in what a successful um, partnership will look like. And, and I think whilst there is, um, there's always respect between um, people involved in the collaboration, their ideas of what a successful collaboration is might be different and or or have a you know different cultural lens. And I'm just wondering if you've a, worked with that or how you approach it to recognize those cultural differences. Yeah, I, I mean I don't think there's one answer to this, of course, Melanie. It's a really complex um complex issue and also probably it will never be found out because it's about different people from different cultures and different spaces um but i was reflecting on your question and reading it i think one of the things that we've experienced um has been an, a necessity within cross-cultural collaborations to really define um the roles of actors within the collaboration and and the example i give is we're often when I see from the outside cross-cultural collaborations or partnerships, what I'm seeing is one party consulting another or, or, or drawing the resources of another. And your example of traditional owners is um, is is one where I, I see that happening. You know, there's a there's a there's an agency or there's a group of agencies that might be government agencies, whatever, and they want to collaborate with traditional owners. But what they really want to do is 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 draw information from them, consult with them, bring. Uh, Bring information out of them and I, I think um, there's you know there's a history to that of course um, and not necessarily an okay one but um, but and but there's still a place for consultation is where I was going with that but if it really is a collaboration between um, cultures then the framework by which people are going to collaborate needs to be um, designed together it needs to be something that that is, that is appropriate and, and, and suits one another so I'd love to say we've been really successful in this. I, I don't think we have. Um, we've certainly tried, um, but I think there's a there's a long way to go to, to defining the roles and goals um, that people come to collaborations with and how they differ from the way we used to do cross-cultural collaboration. Um, when we mentioned the notion of shifting power within these dynamics before, and I think that's probably the best starting point. Um, yeah, I don't know, hope, hopefully that's some way of an answer. Do you have anything to add, Ken? Oh, I think just to, it, it's a really good question, Melanie. I think there's um, there's something about it from the lens of of an evalu of, of evaluation, which is important, and, and obviously to this group uh, that's on the call today, evaluation is critical. So you mentioned different expectations about what it might mean to work within this collaboration, and that'll have effects on the kinds of things that we can choose to evaluate, and, and the methods and tools and approaches by which evaluators might go about doing that. But then, as you say as well, it actually is, is fundamental for the, the formation of the collaboration in, in itself. Um, what are our um, shared and different expectations about what this collaboration is going to do? And as you mentioned, um, are, are these are these built on the foundations of um, collaboration? Are they built on the foundations of partnership? They're built on consultation in different ways. And so, being clear, I think, and, and understanding those different expectations and different starting points of whoever might be collaborating both in the context of forming the collaboration itself, as well as for its evaluation is critical. Mm, and I just saw Kate, what you've put up in the, the chat there as well. I found that to be a really useful resources, resource as well. Yeah, I would highly recommend it. Yeah, there's a few other comments and questions there just about the competitive aspect to um, collaborations. Um, there is, and one other about um, conflict resolution as well. So again, dealing with some of those unintended consequences. Um, yeah, I, I want to just open it really. I think, is, is there anything in particular there that strikes um, unique 
and Cam that's coming out of these um, discussions, these questions now, um, that's particularly kind of interesting or um, surprising for you? I think there's something, thanks Stuart, there's something in there around, I'm just looking at um, Angela, your question about the, the ability of partnerships to resolve conflict mm. um, and to, to, to deal effectively with tension. And Nick's laughing because he knows that I'm conflict diverse. Uh, and so this is something that that I um, that I struggle I struggle with. Um, one of the things that we know uh, is is really unhealthy for partnerships um, uh, uh, is smoothing. Uh, so it's the the papering over the cracks and not talking about the things that we're disagreeing on and not talking about how we are different and not talking about the the elephant in the room, whatever. And, and we've seen lots of partnerships and lots of collaborations that fall into that trap mm -hmm. where uh, the things that, that, that there's there's clearly a, a tension there's clearly something that's not been spoken about but maybe out of politeness uh, it never gets resolved and and that is is such an insidious and unhealthy thing for any partnership to endure and and often maybe if not always will result in the partnership actually failing to generate the results that, that, that it's seeking to do so the the ability of um of a partnership or of a collaboration to actually hold space for conflict and tension to be surfaced in a healthy way for it to be spoken about um for it to be okay for disagreement and different perspectives to exist um that's a critical uh, success factor for for a partnership so i think it's a great question or a great comment that you raise about how can we understand uh, and evidence the ability uh, of partnerships to be able to do that. I think it's a really good point. Uh, yeah, I, I want to build on this, um, Mohib and, um, and Angela, both your questions there about dealing with competitive behaviours. I was thinking, I mean, I was laughing at Cam's conflict diverseness, but I think one of the one of the things that is a, a great benefit to being an evaluator or an, an external evaluator within a collaborative entity is the opportunity and ability to um, to hold a different space. And so I can think of many times where I have been um, uh, the target of conflict, perhaps. So, where, where it's, and it's got nothing to do with me. It's about the partners having a conflict and they directed at the external person. But what's really useful about that, if you're okay with it, is that the, um, is that the partners then get to aggrieve, uh, uh, air those grievances. And then you as an evaluator can kind of get to the nub of it or try to, sometimes it works. Um, you know, is there shared space here? Are you actually focused on the same question? Would you would you be interested in finding out the answer to this? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a bleeding between like uh, improving the partnership and, um, and, and doing the evaluation. But I think sometimes those taking a learning and evaluation lens to those kind of conflict um, discussions can be really good because they're, they're opportunities for people to come together. Um, I think it's a very funny example, so I don't think any of them are allowed to be shared, but, um, but I mean, conflict can sometimes be good in these spaces as well. There's a bit of storming and norming when you get a group of people together who are there for different reasons and want different things. Mm. The other, I'm just looking at some of the other comments, Stuart, in the, the, the comment at the chat function now, there's, there's a couple of comments there about learning. Uh, and knowledge being um, an outcome, uh, maybe being the ultimate outcome for some collaborative initiatives. And I think that that's um, in, in many of the collaborations that we find ourselves working with, it is actually a key goal, uh, either the generation of knowledge and sharing of knowledge, but the uptake of that knowledge and people using that knowledge and changing the way that they're thinking and increasing their knowledge about a particular field or concept or topic. So I think that that's, um, that's a critical outcome, a critical benefit that we see from many of these collaborations, particularly for the ones that are bringing together entities or organisations that come from very different worlds that have got very different knowledge bases or ways of knowing the world. So being able to share that um, in a way that enables others to understand, I don't think is to be skipped over or diminished as being a key contribution of many of these partnerships that we work with. Yeah, I was just reflecting on sort of some of these questions. I, I know that we're closing out, but there's something about um, if you can, as, as an evaluator, help a collaboration, whether it be the secretariat functions, the people kind of bringing everyone together, or the collaborative members themselves, if you can get them to focus on, um, on what they're doing as, as one starting point or one way in and getting them to appreciate that unique value that's, that is coming out of collaborating, and Cam said this before, but 
We get lots of talk about members asking, so what, hang on, have we started achieving these lofty outcomes? Are we gonna, are we making progress towards these big things? And that's really important. But if you can get them also to appreciate, like I had a really great conversation coming together with some, my mind has been changed because of, um, because of the thing that you said. Um, I talk picking up on the knowledge thing. We're generating knowledge together that didn't exist before. We're intersecting and colliding. And those things are really important. They get, they're left unsaid a lot of the time. And if you can spend energy um, on, on capturing them, on sharing them between people, I think it's a really important thing, really important thing in collaboration.